Welcome to Candid Catholic Convos, a program brought to you by the Catholic Diocese of Harrisburg. Our mission is to humanize the church and help you to grow in your faith, love, and understanding. I'm your host, Rachel Troche, a cradle Catholic who's only human and struggled with faith on more than one occasion. Each week, you'll hear engaging, down-to-earth interviews and actionable strategies you can implement into your life with ease to help you grow closer to God. If you're ready to open your heart and step fully into the person God created you to be, then you're in the right place. Let's get started. Hello, and welcome to episode 125 of Candid Catholic Convos and part two of our conversation on authentic friendships. Last week, we waxed poetic about the different types of friendships from Aristotle's theories to Tupac's life lessons. We also chatted about why quality friendships are important and why it may feel like it was easier to make friends as a kid versus now as an adult. Today, we're continuing our conversation with Zach Haney, our director for Youth and Young Adult Ministries, focusing primarily on the deep vulnerability required in meaningful relationships the effects of social media and isolation, and some tactful ways we can maintain or pursue new friendships. Kind of going back to what we were saying about the the creation of a of a close friendship, I it it requires um, a level of deep vulnerability with another mm-hmm. person, mm-hmm. Um, and its vulnerability, in my opinion, has to be earned, um, especially like if if we've been burned in the past. So how do we find the courage to be open and vulnerable in friendships, especially new ones, because you don't want to be like the oversharer and like get so vulnerable so quickly and because then you kind of face that rejection. But then where do you, and maybe this is a little like extra deep, but like, how do we, how do we determine when, when it's okay to be super vulnerable, especially if it's like, like I said, like if you've been burned in the past where you mm-hmm. got, you started getting close with somebody and they turned out to not be the type of friend that you thought they were. Okay. Well, a few things I think before we go into the answer, like a few truths uh, I think we need to go over. Number one, I think it should be clarified that we're not called to be friends with everybody. Mm-hmm. Like that's, I think people might be confused and think that we are called to love everybody. We are called to will the good of every, every person on this planet as our brothers and sisters in Christ, but not everyone has to be your friend. Right. Uh, I think someone once described it. I heard as I want you to eat, but not necessarily at my table, like that type of thing. Not that exclusionary type of thing. It's like, I still want you to be well off. I still want you to like be with the Lord type of thing, but maybe that's not a path we're walking like side by side, hand in hand. I feel like like Tupac might've said that or something like that. I was trying to hide the fact that it was Tupac. (laughs) But you're right. But he's it not is wrong. Tupac. He's not yeah, wrong. Like it, it was Tupac. She called me out. <laughs> um, yeah. So, that, yeah, the idea of we are all called to will each other to heaven, but we don't all necessarily walk that road hand in hand. Mm. Um, so when it comes to like people being burned, for example, like when when a f- friendship needs to dissolve, it doesn't mean like I hate you. You're my enemy now. Just because you were... Maybe that's the other thing. It's just because we're not friends doesn't mean we're enemies. Mm. Like that's, I think some people in our society think that if like you're not friends, you're enemies. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's not true. I mean, we can be brothers and sisters in Christ without being like friends or like in that like close sense of the word. Um, So we're called not to have enemies necessarily. Well, that's not true. We end up getting enemies no matter what, if Mm -hmm. we're really living the gospel. But now I'm starting to digress. So let's circle back. (laughs) Um, Yes. So we, we don't have to be friends with everyone even if you're supposed to love everyone. So that's truth number one. And truth number two, I think that everyone needs to learn to accept is that every friend in your life is going to let you down at some point, no matter what. So you're, it doesn't matter if it's your, your best friend ever, or one of like your more like acquaintancy friends, one of those like practical or um, like fun friends, they're going to let you down. Like even the people closest to you are probably going to be more likely to let you down because um, they're so close. But we're all imperfect human beings. More often than not, we let each other down, not because we mean to, like not because we like want to tear the other person down and to ruin them. It's just because we're imperfect human beings and, you know, sin happens. Like it just, yeah. So I think that's another thing we have to go into. Like our best friends may hurt us, but it's knowing that, 
that doesn't necessarily mean that that friendship is like ruined or not necessarily supposed to happen. Now, obviously you have to look at intent. You know, you look at it and be like, okay, did they mean to hurt me? Or is this the result of malice or is this the result of just fallen human nature? And is there that desire to make amends? Is that desire to move forward? Um, I think correcting the earlier statement a little bit of, it's not just two good friends shouldn't just be two holy people. It's two people striving for holiness. Mm. So that might mean you guys just trip and fall and stumble your way up to heaven. But as long as that intent to move forward is there, I think that's, that's important. Um, knowing that you are going to fall, but that desire to get back up and to keep going together. Now, if one person doesn't have that desire and they're more just holding you back and pushing you down on purpose type of thing. That's maybe it's like, okay, like I still want you to make your way that way, but you go over there and I'm going to be over here. So I think those are two things to remember. Uh, but so when it comes to authentic friendship, so that idea of being open and vulnerable, I, I completely agree. Um, I, you know, when I give talks uh, about friendship, uh, like within youth ministry, I talk about this idea that like surface level friendship or like base level friendship, like starting friendship is about common interests, like common likes, like common positive things, but like true deep friendship comes from like sharing our wounds, like knowing like this stuff about us that's broken. So like the woundedness actually is like opens, like is opening. Like if you really think about it, like wounds in the body, open the body. And so in sharing our wounds, we're like, that's being open. Like that's opening ourselves up to um, someone else. So like, I think Christ is like this example of this is his woundedness. Like he, he opened himself up completely like on the cross, like wounded himself, like op- like physically opened his body um, was the ultimate vulnerable uh, in order to become our friend, like our companion, like our, um, yeah, just, and that's, I mean, we're called to that. That doesn't mean that that's where you start. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as you said, it's trust is earned. Um, I think I heard it said that when, when making, trying to develop these friendships, uh, first you choose. So like you find someone that you think will be, that i mean you mutually choose like first of all you don't choose someone and they don't choose you type of thing it's not like oh we're gonna be best friends but they're like we're gonna be acquaintances like it's got to be mutual there's this like mutual choice um then there's the testing so like there's that like you don't immediately like choose each other's best friends and then all of a sudden like just spill your entire life story out onto them and like everything about yourself um there's like that testing that there's that progressive like you start that surface level and you slowly go deeper like you don't immediately go deep And then when you feel like, and then there's that opening at the end, like when you feel like, you know, they've been tested and they've been found trustworthy and they've been found um, to have those same values as you and wanting to go in the same direction. Like that's when you can start to open yourself up to that more like intimate connection, that, um, that more personal, that best friendship, that perfect friendship. Um, So the tip would be to be patient in that, like, don't jump right off the deep end. Um, most people will be scared by that. <laughs> Both the sharers and the person you're that's being shared with is going to be like scared by that. Cause you're going to like share your whole thing and you're going to be like, Oh my gosh, what have I done? And the other person's going to be like, Oh my gosh, that was a lot. <laughs> this is a lot of pressure. And I'm not sure if I can reciprocate that right now. So that idea of going slow, like go slow. Best friendship is not something that starts immediately. Actually, most best friendships probably start as like a practical or mm-hmm. like a fun friendship. And then slowly evolve into best friendship. Um, so, yeah, going slow, making sure that, you know, you time, like, when you reveal certain stuff. Um, yeah, and, but and, and vulnerability, even going slow is hard. It's just having that courage to be vulnerable. Like, having that courage um, to face that eventual failure or to face that uh, rejection, even, Um You know, I mean, we only have to look at, you know, Jesus Christ once again. Like he made himself vulnerable by making himself a human and knowing full well he was going to be rejected by a lot of people. And then even made himself into a piece of bread, knowing even more people were probably going to reject him um, in the Eucharist. This idea is that God continuously made himself more vulnerable and continuously opened himself to more rejection. But that that's kind of the price. Like we have to take that risk. Um 
knowing that we could get burned. Um, but it's not really going to be worth it. You're not really going to have that closeness without that risk, without that vulnerability, without that chance that it could go wrong. So. That's very true. And I, I love that all we have to really do is kind of just look back to God. Cause you're right. He, I mean, how much more vulnerable could you be than naked hanging from a tree with exactly. like, literally cuts and you're bleeding everywhere. Like that's. Or even just going from the fact you're an infinite God, there is no way that any human could ever touch you. And then you become a human, which now you're killable. Like mm -hmm. That idea is that God made himself into something that was killable. <laughs> and what did we do? We killed him. Like, it's, yeah. So like ultimate vulnerability. And that's kind of a microcosm in relationship with us. Like with any relationship, that's what we have to do. We almost we're making ourselves killable, quote unquote, mm -hmm. to the other person. Um, but it's not love, really, unless we make ourselves we take that risk and we make ourselves that vulnerable. I want to talk a little bit about isolation because I had read an article in psychology today that stated friendlessness, mm -hmm. uh, you know, accompanied by a sense of isolation is, is on the rise. And I suspect that the pandemic really didn't help. Um, and that the mental and physical ordeals of seeking, finding and sustaining real world friendships is more daunting, um, especially because we live in a digital age. Mm -hmm. How, how do we transition digital friendships into real world friendships. Hmm. Yes, I, I would agree that this is a little bit of a problem. Uh, and I think it's partly because of the nature of technology, not the technology is bad, but I mean, technology needs to be used as a means to an end and not an end in itself. When we look at it, though, just from the perspective of an end in itself, um, one, I think technology has given us a glimpse of the world that has overwhelmed people. You know, this idea is it used to be you just only knew what was around you. Now you can see the entire world, which is great um, to know about the world. But the, knowing about the entire world can also be overwhelming. Like mm -hmm. having more of that sense of how many people are really out there, how many different kinds of people are really out there. When more often than not, the people that are going to mean most in our life and like affecting our life are going to be the ones that are right in our immediate vicinity. Um, so I think there's that level of bigness that, you know, the world is seeing or, or that uh, kids are seeing that can be overwhelming. Like now you're not just interacting with your class. Like if you're on Instagram, you're interacting with literally anybody from the entire world, like millions and millions of users, um, that can just, I mean, look at most people's stuff, like people follow. I think <laughs> when you have followers now, that's the thing we have followers now in social media, we don't have friends, like mm -hmm. we have followers, like, so it's more of that inclination of that lack of personal connection that social media provides. Cause now, yeah, we're not friends. I just kind of watch you and what you do. It makes um, you extra vulnerable because anytime that you're putting yourself out there, mm -hmm. anybody in the world, whether they mean well or not can make a comment, which could create a wound for you. Exactly. But I also think it's this level of that. The internet and the digital world also provides like this, wall so to speak that even the most well-intentioned people the ones that are trying to be the most authentic are never completely authentic on the internet like you're always only looking at a small glimpse of a person mm -hmm. like you're only seeing even if it's just their words and their photos like things can be edited um and even when things aren't edited or changed like they can be omitted like most of the time like we're not posting every single thought that we ever have or everything that we ever say, like on the internet, we're not like taking pictures of every single second of our lives. You're only seeing a snapshot and you're forming your opinion of a person based on a small snapshot of their life. Um, no matter how much we try um, to like, think that that's diff that's not the case. Um, so I do think technology can be the start of a friendship. But I, it can never be like the whole of a friendship because mm. uh, I do think friendship requires physical proximity because there's so much about people that you can't understand unless you're around them. Um, things that they wouldn't even able to describe to you about who they are, how they act, um, you know, just their identity as a person. Like it's just there's just things that you can't get from words and pictures alone or videos or what have you you need to just be around and i think any of us who have like a really close best friend would be able to understand not describe but understand that that there's just these things and these quirks and that make this person who they are that you just would not be able to know unless you were around them um so that proximity creating familiarity um and it's that illusionariness of technology of like thinking 
we're being intimate with people thinking we're knowing everything about a person. Like it's, it's an illusion so that we think that that's enough. Mm -hmm. And it's like, Oh, that's all. But at the same time we hide behind it because it's like that wall, the wall that not only keeps the other person from seeing the other person, but also keeps us safe Mm -hmm. because now we don't have to be as vulnerable. Like we don't have to be imperfect. Like we don't have to show people those things that they might see when you're in person that are like those quirks that maybe you're self-conscious about or whatever, but that make you who you are. Right. Like that That's part of who you are. Um, and that are actually maybe even endearing to a lot of people, just maybe if they aren't to you, but um, so like that close proximity, but like technology gives that illusion of proximity that it's not actually there um, and gives us an excuse to, to hide, to like, to not be vulnerable. Like we can, we can look to the outside without being in the outside. Got it. Um, so I think that one can – and I feel like one needs to be careful when trying to form friendships online because I know – well, I, back when I was a kid, there was all that like, ah, oh, don't talk to people you don't know on the internet because, you know, they're going to be some weirdo criminal that is going to, like, kill you or ruin your life or whatever. Um Which, first of all, I want to say, that's not not the case anymore. (laughs) There are plenty of those people still out there. Uh, So I think really you need to be careful meeting people online because that's – I don't know. It's and that well, that's the thing about technology. We can all pretend to be someone that we're not. Mm-hmm. So that's not even just in the microcosm of like uh I am perfect and even though I'm imperfect, like I look perfect on the internet, even though I'm imperfect. But it literally can be I am pretending to be like someone that is your age and I am not. Um so I think that's why it's really <sighs> difficult to recommend trying to initiate friendships online. So maybe I I'm actually resenting my statement from before. I don't think technology should be a gateway into friendships because of that, because you can't really know what you're getting into. I think it could bolster current friendships. That's what social media used to be. Mm-hmm. It used to be you were you were friends online with the friends you were with in real life. And that was like, a, oh, we can communicate now and share about our lives, even though we're not there all the time. But now when it can be just like I can meet anybody online and um, try to initiate friendships and stuff online. Like, I just think that gets more tricky, a little bit more like dangerous. Well, cause it's still like you were saying, there's still that distance. So it can still create some sense of, some sense of isolation in that. Like, like I know that this person I follow on social media isn't my friend, but there's marketing strategies that teach you, that, or that these people are using to get you to like, know, and trust them. Um, so it makes you mm. feel like you're in a in a friendship or like, oh, I know this person from being online. Um, but in reality, you don't actually know them. So it can create this sense of isolation. And then if you are not within a physical proximity of your actual friends, like you feel like you start to – you start to feel like the world is kind of like a lot smaller – than it is. And it can kind of create, like make you retreat into yourself, I guess. Um, cause I think the, the technology, like you said, like I remember when Facebook came out, like it was only for college kids and you could only be friends with people that you knew. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then it just kind of blew up into anybody who's anybody can have a social media account and can tell you anything they want, um, whether it's true or not. And, uh, it's just, it's like you were saying, like, I don't think we were meant to have so much access Mm -hmm. to everything. Like in, in a sense, in one way it can be good, but in another way it can be so overwhelming that you just feel like you'd rather just curl up in a ball and like not even look outside. Yeah. And I, I, going back even to the social media thing, we talk about this idea of that, like mutual friendship, like this idea is it's gotta be mutual. We have to like choose each other. Mm Mm-hmm. It, that's the way social media used to be like on Facebook and stuff. It would be like, I send friend request, you accept friend request. Now it's just, you can follow anybody mm-hmm. like you. And it's more of like, you follow someone first. And if you don't like that person following you or someone follows you first, and if you don't like that person following you, you like block them or something mm-hmm. like that. So there's that on even this mutuality at the beginning of a lot of social media. It's just like, I can follow this person no matter what. doesn't matter if they like me or not. They So there's not that mutualness. That's why it's not really friendship. It's it's like you're not choosing each other. Mm-hmm. Like just one party is choosing. Um, 
and that social media, as you were you were brushing on, gives this illusion with big time personalities like, you know, uh, not even just in the secular world, like someone like a Taylor Swift, but also in even in the Catholic world, like someone like a Father Mike Schmitz mm -hmm. is social media can give this illusion that we are friends with these people. Um, but we're not. <laughs> you may want to be like or but like you are not like these people's close people that they they rely on and i think social media makes us feel like we are because we get this like glimpse into their life and maybe it's a little bit more like than like fan mail used to be like we can see a little yeah. bit more but it's still not you're not in their life in that way that does not mean they don't love or care about you or appreciate you like and that's even like you know father mike schmitz he's a priest he loves all the children of god but even someone like a taylor swift i'm sure like appreciates all of her fans and like cares about them in a certain way, but that doesn't mean you are like friends. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you're this this mutual like walking hand in hand type type of friends. And that one shouldn't be offended by that, right? Um, but I think we have this illusion then that we like we follow all these celebrities and we like all these people of interest and like we think they're like our friends. They're like our replacement friends, but they're they're really not. Um, so I think that can be really dangerous when you get into that when like the people you follow on instagram are more personalities than they are actual people you interact with that's mm -hmm. that i think can be a little bit of a problem and we can feel that isolation because i think our consciousness i think it deep down our subconscious i think we know like we know that we might be trying to convince ourselves that like oh i have all these friends and i'm interacting with all these people like via the internet but like deep down we know it's not the same like as um as spending actual time with people like we know that we're still alone in a room like we we feel it and mm -hmm. i think um it's not going to be satisfied by just interacting with people on the internet so it reminds me of um did you ever read fahrenheit 451 i did and the chapter i wish i knew what chapter it was but she was like watching all the big screens and oh, she yeah. referred to them as her family and i was like now looking at it now i'm like oh this yeah. is that's what that's what we've become <laughs> yeah and i mean this can even happen with stuff like tv shows and stuff. exactly we, we, we inundate ourselves with that and we start to think that like uh like the characters on the office are mm -hmm. like our friends and our family but the, but they're not they're no. fiction they're not real um we might relate to them we might be inspired by them in certain ways or but we might feel like we are being seen by society by the fact that they're portrayed in a way that like is like us but that doesn't mean they're our friends or our family. Um, so I think that's, yeah, that's like, we got to keep an eye out for like, that all stuff has its purpose, but they're, they're tools. Mm -hmm. They're means to an end. They're not an end in themselves. Um, like the TV show is that's entertainment and that's some way to relate, but it's not friends or like Facebook or other social media is meant to connect us or help us keep up with other people. It's like for information, it's not for bonding um, it by itself. Uh, it's just a way to help, I suppose, with that. I agree. So we've talked about the different types of friendships and we've talked about making ourselves available. What are some ways, what are some tactile ways that we can actively pursue authentic friendships? Like mm -hmm. I really want a best friend or I want to deepen my relationship with my best friend. How do we, how do we do that? Mm-hmm. I guess um, even before I go into that, I mean, one other thing I want to mention uh, about the last question that I think some people fall into, like we have a lot of these also these forum things like on, on online, like mm -hmm. this idea of forums, like which I'm not necessarily against forums, stuff like Reddit and things like that. But I think we also need to remember that that is information. That's mm -hmm. like I ask a question, I get some answers. It's not those people are, just because those people might care about you even like they might even care that, that you have like a like a like the answer is correct in a certain way, but they're not your friends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, they could be even, even if they are friends, they're like practical friends. Like you chat on this forum because you have questions about certain things. You both things. have a beagle kind of thing. Yeah, you're exactly. You're asking questions about beagles. and Exactly. But this part, these people are not your best friends. Like they're not your true friends. They're not those companions on the journey. Um, so I think, that especially, I think, has become a big thing recently is that, you know, we have these kids that are like throwing their whole trust at people on these forums um, because just because they have like some there are some good people on there or some people that like have right answers or some people that have this thing in common with them that all of a sudden they're this like really close confidant that 
um, that you can trust and all that stuff. But I think that uh, it's important to note that that is not necessarily like a replacement for friendship. They can be good people and they can um, like you can have fun with those things, but that's not a replacement for friendship. Um, Absolutely. So. So, OK, going to authentic friendships, like what do we do? So brushing on those things we were just talking about. One of the biggest things you can do to find authentic friendship is just get out there. You have to be in places to meet people. That's that's the biggest thing. You have to be in places to meet people. I was once told a statistic that, um, and this may seem unrelated as I'm saying it, but I promise it comes back, uh, that we are the byproduct of the five people we spend the most time with. Mm. So we are formed by those five people that we dedicate our time to. So you got to be intentional. So when I say put yourself out there, put yourself in a place where you can meet people, you need to put yourself in a place where you're going to find those people that are going to be positive influence on you. Like that, like what type of person do I want to be? And so where am I going to meet those people? So if you're like, I want to grow in virtue, I want to grow in faith, well, then go to like a church group or activity or young adult ministry activity. (laughs) I'm sure we're going to circle back to that by the end. But this idea of you go to a place with the people that you want to be like, so to speak. Um, That doesn't mean you can't have like a friend that's, um, you know, even a close friend that like you don't agree with or you don't want to live a life like theirs. Um, Because it's five people. It's the five closest people. It's not like the one closest person. It's the five closest people. And you might be having a positive influence on them. But you still have to have a decent amount of people in those five that are a positive influence on you. We've unfortunately run out of time. But if you'd like to hear the rest of this episode, you can listen to us anytime on Spotify under Candid Catholic Convos. Or you can download this episode from our website at hbgdiocese.org. Thank you so much for listening. Our goal at the Diocese of Harrisburg is to walk with you on your faith journey. So if this episode resonated with you in any way, the easiest way to show your appreciation is by sharing this program with your network or by leaving a review on your listening platform. You can also support us financially by making a donation online at hbgdiocese.org slash D-A-C and clicking the make a donation button. Thanks again, and we'll see you at church on Sunday.